Let's take a look at Euler Bernoulli beam theory. I'm not going to do a detailed derivation. In fact, uh, many of you might have seen this before because it's taught in introductory statics. I'm going to focus on the big ideas and the so what the equations you know uh, represent. What are the physical principles on which it's based, and what are the assumptions? And that's what you need to know to use the this particular model well in, in a tool like ANSYS. So here's a schematic of my beam. So the box, you know, represents the beam. And I have also shown you the midline over here. I have put, you know, so I've said this is the x direction and that's y direction. We hold the, the beam at this end. And for the purpose of the derivation, I'll assume that the force at the right end is in the positive y direction. So when we apply the force in ANSYS, we will give it a negative sign because it's in the other direction. By the way, um, ANSYS, when we do this particular model in ANSYS, um, we will be using, ANSYS uses the Timoshenko beam theory which you can think of as an extension of the Euler Bernoulli beam theory. The Timoshenko beam theory includes shear deformations. For slender beams like what we have over here, the Euler Bernoulli beam theory and the Timoshenko beam theory will agree very closely. So to keep the discussion tractable, I'll just assume that you know what ANSYS is using is the Euler Bernoulli beam theory, and that's sufficient over here. Now, under the effect of this load, if I look at the midline, so I've just drawn the, the midline over here with the axis, and then I have the load over here, and I'll exaggerate what the deformation will look like. Okay, it's going to look something like that. And I will assume that there is no axial load. So let me list assumptions here. So there's just a transverse load. Now, you can relax this assumption relatively easily, uh, but to keep the details simple, I'll just, I'll just assume that. Now, since we don't have any axial load, if we take some point like that, and let me say that's A, it's just going to move in the y direction, okay? And it's going to move over here. So the displacement is just going to be in the y direction, and that displacement I will denote as U sub y. So if I have, um, the let's say the point A is over here, Okay, that's what is happening to A. And let me draw the axis. And so A is, you know, I'll just say A is somewhere over here. L let's take a look at a cross section. So if you take a cross section at A, and I'll just, uh, so it's going to be, you know, in something like that, the cross section. And I'll draw it over here. Under the influence of the load, what you assume is that the cross, so what's hap going to happen to the cross section? So that's, you know, that's really the key to the model. So A is going to move up, and I'm just exaggerating it. So A is going to be something like that. And here you make really the key assumption that's the heart of the Euler Bernoulli beam theory, which is you assume that the cross section will just rotate by, you know, um, together. So, and you know, usually this is, you say that plane sections remain plane. This is really the key assumption on which the whole framework rests. And we'll assume that, you know, the rotation is in the positive direction. So counterclockwise is positive with this coordinate system. And So 
So that's the original cross section, that's a rotated cross section, and let's say the angle of rotation is theta. And if I um, pick a point such as B on the cross section, okay, it's just going to be, let's say, that's B over here. And I can figure out from trigonometry how much B has moved in the x direction. So the amount B has moved in the x direction is going to be that. So that's going to be U sub x. And that's going to depend on how far B is from A. So typically this is denoted as Y. And from trigonometry, you can convince yourself that that distance here is just y sine theta. And since it's moved in the negative x direction, there's a negative sign. And one can you know, check this intuitively. So the farther b is from the midline, the more it's going to move in the x direction. So the points at the ends are going to move the most. Um, so that makes sense. And then larger the rotation angle, the more it's going to move so that you can understand intuitively and then now what you do is you say hey you know I'm looking um, I'll assume that theta is small and so this can be written as minus y theta <coughs> one more thing you do is so you have this midline over here and you know it deforms something like that and if you look at the slope at that location, okay, that slope is the same theta. So whether you're looking at the, the rotation of the cross section or whether you're looking at the slope, they are the same theta. And that theta then is given by just, so this is uy of x. And so that's just, equal to the slope and the slope is duy by dx okay this is uy sorry about my chicken scratch and uy you assume that it's only a function of x really you know the point b moves a little bit um, you know a little bit more or less than a in the y direction but you ignore that difference and you say, hey, you know, I'll assume that the whole cross section moves the same distance in the y direction. So this is really an approximate thing. So key things happen here, okay? Now, if I know the equation of the midline, okay, uy of x, I can figure out what the displacement in the x direction and y direction is of any point on the cross section. And so I've reduced the problem to finding this, uh, the equation of the midline. This is really the heart of the euler bernoulli beam theory. And I found students getting like really confused about it and it took me a long time to understand it. So, you know, if you want, it'll serve you well if you take some time to sink your teeth into these ideas because a whole framework rests on it.